But uh, uh, again, others have said it, but thank you very much uh, for coming out. Nice to get a warm reception on an otherwise uh, chilly evening. So tonight, I want to talk about earthquakes, the state of earthquake uh, readiness in Alaska, and things that are on our plate uh, at the community and state level uh, right now uh, surrounding earthquakes. So if you're uh, interested, the, the picture that's on the screen here, uh, that's actually the Richardson Highway. Uh, we found this, I hadn't seen this figure until, uh, this photograph until a couple of months ago. Uh, this was taken in 1937 following the earthquake in Salcha that was probably the most significant uh, local earthquake in our, uh, in historic uh, times uh, at least. And I, uh, yeah, I've, I've always, got, I've liked this figure ever since of this photograph with the child down in the crack. Don't do that at home, I don't recommend it, but it does give you some sense of uh, scale, I guess. So we're coming off kind of an interesting year for earthquakes. 2014, I had a lot of uh, not damaging, not uh, critical types of earthquakes, but a lot of intriguing uh, ones. This is a figure, there are all the little teeny tiny gray dots on this figure are earthquakes in 2014 that we're aware of. As you all certainly understand, there are big earthquakes and then lots and lots and lots of little ones. Uh, many of these would constitute those uh, little ones, but you might have caught in the news that we uh, surpassed a, a record as, uh, at the Earthquake Center, locating 40,000 this past year, which we were uh, uh, fairly keen on. I'm going to single out a few during the course of this talk and uh, we'll come back and hit them uh, as examples in a few different uh, places. So I want to take just a moment and step through just a quick recap about highlights, if you will, of 2014, a couple of things that are on our minds. So a couple of these earthquakes. Uh, anybody feel the earthquake in Southeast? Anybody happen to be in Southeast uh, back in July for the Palma Bay earthquake? I didn't feel it. I don't expect too many folks in this audience. Widely felt in Juneau, it was the biggest shaking or the strongest shaking uh, in Juneau in uh, at least a decade uh, or so. So a very significant uh, earthquake there. We're going to zoom in just a little bit. The earthquake occurred, if you start in Juneau and you go outboard uh, to the, the Fairweather Fault, right along, uh, the, well, really at the coast, uh, that's where the earthquake occurred. And we're going to zoom in in the next figure to this area right in here. It's kind of a blow up. And one of the things that made this earthquake uh, significant, uh, though its impacts on Juneau and surrounding communities was, was fairly modest as far as infrastructure, it did take out a telecommunications fiber that was uh, in the seafloor, on the seafloor, one of the primary communication links into Juneau. And it's a good little reminder of the connectedness with which we live these days. Uh, I forget exactly, four o'clock in the morning or so, uh, a good chunk of Southeast lost telephone communications, lost uh, internet, all those weird connected things we don't think about or we take for granted these days. You know, uh, the ability to use credit cards because you need to check data, uh, verify data, things like this. Uh, they, uh, a lot of folks lost all that uh, for some time until uh, repairs were made and some alternative arrangements uh, were made. But it was a good little reminder of some of the different kinds of vulnerabilities we don't necessarily think about when we're talking about earthquakes. Uh, the next earthquake uh, we, we refer to as the Squentna earthquake. Uh, rattled uh, Anchorage fairly well and was felt uh, some here in Fairbanks, I believe. Anyone feel that earthquake? All right, we got some hands up. I didn't. I wasn't in town. But uh, it was felt pretty broadly. Magnitude 6.3, uh, that too was the strongest shaking, in this case in Anchorage, uh, in a decade uh, or more. So another significant earthquake as far as uh, at least percept, uh, being able to perceive it. A lot of photos circulated uh, after that earthquake. There were no major infrastructure uh, challenges or significant damage that I'm aware of, but lots of rattled uh, homes and offices, shelves falling over, things of this nature. But pretty, uh, but for the most part, damage was limited to things that individuals can address or deal with. I'm not going to talk plate tectonics tonight. Uh, many of the other venues at this, or uh, talks in this venue, you might hear a lot about that. And you guys turned out on a cold night 
on a Tuesday, I think you're kind of, I'm guessing you're kind of a scientifically literate subset of Fairbanks. So, thank you. But I'm not going to talk a lot about plate tectonics other than to recap the basics that I suspect many people know, which is most earthquakes in this state can be traced back in some way to what we refer to as subduction or the, the, the process by which the Pacific tectonic plate is being forced down underneath Alaska. This very simple cartoon drawing, ridiculously simple cartoon drawing, uh, really captures uh, in some sense a lot of the reasons we have uh, earthquakes. The, the Squentna earthquake was interesting because it actually occurred very far, let's call it inboard, uh, of Anchorage. If we put Anchorage kind of up here, it was actually down here kind of deep and not unexpected in any way, but not usually the earthquake we're thinking about. When we're worried about uh, significant damage in South Central, this isn't usually the earthquake we think about. So that was uh, an interesting tidbit from it. Rat Islands, magnitude 7.9 in June. Anybody here felt that? I I'm going to yeah, I'm going to guess there are more people in this room right now than felt that earthquake in total. I can't verify that, but that's my, my sort of back of the envelope calculation. And yet, this was the second biggest earthquake in the world last year. This is a huge, huge earthquake. This is, in order to get this earthquake from the, uh, the, the Squentna one, the, the earthquake we just looked at, it would take 250 of those all occurring at the same time right here to equal or to create uh, this earthquake. Huge. When you have a big earthquake in the Aleutians, uh, one of the primary concerns is the tsunami uh, hazard generated by the earthquake. And <clears throat> there was a perceptible tsunami from this earthquake. It was recorded in many places uh, across the Pacific. However, there was no uh, appreciable uh, tsunami threat or uh, damage from it because uh, there was, well, it was a very small motion. The reason, like the previous earthquake, it too occurred quite deep in the earth. And so it wasn't moving land. The seafloor itself wasn't shifting up and down in ways that generate a uh, very large waves. So we, uh, we evaded that one successfully as well. Lastly, the uh, earthquake series in Minto. Anybody feel that one? Yeah, we're in Fairbanks, so of course, lots of folks. And if you missed the first one over Labor Day weekend, you might want caught one of the follow-up ones uh, a couple of months later in October. Much smaller, I'm going to point out, than the other earthquakes we're talking about here. It would take 10,000 of these to make that Rat Islands earthquake. Think about that for a minute. 10,000 of that earthquake happening at once. It's not in Fairbanks. It's about 40 miles north, uh, northwest of here in the Minto uh, region. Again, we have the, the sequence of a few uh, of the larger felt earthquakes. But there were large numbers of aftershocks, and we're able to record them well in this area. So here's a figure I want to share with you. Take a moment to get your head around this. This is five, the last five months of data. These are the number of earthquakes out in this region, in the Minto region, uh, as a function of time. So total, up through the end of the year, we had had just shy of 2,500 uh, detectable earthquakes out there. Now, I want you to look at August. So this would be what we consider a background rate of earthquakes here. There were maybe eh, 30, 40 earthquakes in the span of a month. After the big the earthquake of Labor Day weekend and all the aftershocks, you know, in the first two months there were 1,500 or so earthquakes. You can see that rate kind of dying off. See how it starts to flatten out there? And had nothing else happened, eventually we would expect it to kind of go back to background rate. But then we had those other two zingers uh, in October, and that rate of earthquakes shot back up and again began to level off. I will tell you, we've been watching this tail because it hasn't really flattened out yet. And I don't think anyone would be surprised if there was follow-on activity out there. To us, that's a sign. We're still at about double. I checked uh, the last couple of weeks. We're maybe double the background rate of earthquakes out there. Um, and it hasn't quite died off. So there's a potential, certainly, that that's an indication that something's still restless. Some stress hasn't been relieved yet, but only time will tell. <clears throat> 
So there's a few of the things that have happened uh, in the last year. Four very, very different earthquakes. Very different places, very different causes, different magnitudes, different, uh, different felt uh, reports. None of them damaging. Um, but I want to look at the magnitude part of that, because the magnitude part is a little unsatisfying. Uh, the significance of these earthquakes didn't scale by magnitude. The magnitude 7.9 earthquake really, much as it seems weird, really didn't do much at all as far as uh, impacting people. So somehow magnitude isn't capturing what we really want. We want something else, something beyond magnitude. And we're going to come back and hit on that uh, for a while. First thing I want to do is just I want to I uh, talk a little bit about our organization and where all this information comes from. Maybe a little bit of ego in this, but I'm very proud of what we do. And uh, I, like, I always take an opportunity to share with people where that comes from. Because earthquake information, we treat a little bit like the weather. You, just, you turn on the radio in the morning, you hear about what, you know, well, what happened last night. 4 o'clock in the morning, magnitude 6 point whatever. Well, that comes from somewhere. So quickly, I'll step through a few slides that give you some flavor for what that process is and, uh, and how we get there. So I'll start by highlighting people. As with all uh, endeavors like this, there are real human beings behind uh, this activity. These are the faces of the Alaska Earthquake Center. Wide range of disciplines from uh, uh, technical skills in keeping uh, field equipment running to data analysis to outreach and education, a lot of different things that come together uh, to make the center run. Most of you probably know this because I think a decent fraction of you in the room actually work here. Uh, this is the Geophysical Institute. We are housed at the GI in the LV building. And uh, it, it is open. People do come through. People are uh, welcome at times. There are opportunities for tours. However, to be really honest, if you want to be part of a discussion about earthquakes, if you've got questions, if you want to talk to people, the best place really is, I hate to say it, it's probably our Facebook page. I don't care if you go there and click the little like button or whatever. I don't, I don't know if there is one. Um, it's, what I care about is it's, a real, it's probably the most vibrant discussion of earthquakes in Alaska that's going on right now. So it's always there and uh, it's been a great resource, a, a good opportunity for people to throw around questions that don't get answered here, for example. Here's the seismic network. <clears throat> This is uh, a map of the stations that record. These are earthquake monitoring stations uh, around the state. Uh, they are operated by the center as well as partner organizations like the Volcano Observatory and other groups uh, that we work with. And all of that data we use uh, to track uh, activity around the state. In our urban centers, Fairbanks, Anchorage, we've got much denser uh, equipment to try and provide a little more connection with the built uh, environment. Uh, but this is really the backbone of what we do. Data from all of these sensors comes into uh, the center in real time. Here's what an earthquake might look like. This is actually the big Rat Islands <coughs> earthquake. Each one of these lines is one seismogram. It's about 20 minutes worth of data. And what we're looking at is stations that were really close to the earthquake out in the Aleutians. Earthquake shows up there, and over the next five minutes, we watch it kind of ripple out to all the other stations. And so using that kind of information, using the timing, the relative timing of arrivals is how we track, how we figure out where uh, earthquakes occur. I'm going to show, uh, that's right, I've got a little video over here kind of to show that process. Strange icon there. Um, we're going to take a look. This is the, the Squintna earthquake, so the earthquake north of Anchorage back in September. And what we see is a little circle, a little colored circle at each seismic station. And the color of that circle represents the ground uh, motion. So what we're going to see when the earthquake starts is we're, we are going to see that motion ripple out. It'll start there, and it'll take time to get to the other stations. This is sped up about 20 times faster roughly than real life. So it'll go kind of quick. But here comes the earthquake. And there it goes. So you can see it starts in the middle and it radiates out. Takes a little while to get out to the uh, Alaska Peninsula, finally out there and all the way up north. 
And then eventually it begins to fade away. And now this is just chatter. This is just the, the seismic waves, the energy bouncing all around the place uh, after, you know, in the minutes uh, after the earthquake. I'm just going to go back to that. Uh, I'm just going to step through this. Let's see. There we go. I kind of like to do this back and forth, back and forth. You can kind of see that it ripples out, starts in the middle. Really simple. I know everyone probably thinks about it. It's not that different than a ripple in a pond. But that motion is exactly what's used to pinpoint where earthquake comes from. So all that information goes out through all sorts of different mechanisms now. I think there's a new phone app every day or every week that's willing to notify me when there's an earthquake uh, in Alaska because data goes all over the place. But if it's a, something from Alaska, ultimately all of this data traces back to uh, what goes on uh, at the earthquake center. It just goes out through many, many, many different mechanisms. So one of our emphases is the here and now. You know, the most important earthquake is usually the one that happened two minutes ago. You know, so a lot of our efforts go into that 24-7 sort of response. But in addition, we track what's happened over the past many, many years. We keep that record. The old uh, adage that uh, you know, history repeats itself turns out to be one of our more powerful tools in figuring out or anticipating what to expect in the future, looking at the something near half a million now, I believe, earthquakes in the catalog, we call it, uh, the historical catalog. They give us a lot of clues, not all the clues, but a lot of clues about what to expect in the future. So onward, here we go. I want to go back to this question, though, of how, well, the shortcomings of magnitude and what we really care about. Because I think what we really, what actually impacts people, what impacts buildings, what impacts communities, not the magnitude of an earthquake, but the shaking itself. So I'll illustrate that. This is data recorded in several places around Fairbanks uh, during the August 30th uh, Minto earthquake. And what you see is a lot of variety. These are about 25 seconds uh, long. Different kinds of signals in each place. Clearly, there's a ton of information uh, in there, but that's kind of a mouthful to carry around. It's hard to explain that to someone. Um, we're looking for ways to distill that to simple numbers, something the equivalent of like a magnitude scale or something uh, that we could say, oh, well, it shook as blank here, but blank there, and talk about these differences. Because if you're building in Esther, versus on China Ridge, you might want to understand that, you know what, those earthquakes are really felt quite differently in those two places. So I'm going to back up. I'm going to step aside here for a minute, talk about uh, how we measure motion. And this is, uh, this is my coffee cup on the dashboard of the car filled with steaming hot coffee. I'm going to bet, I'll make a challenge here, but I think I can drive 60 miles an hour down the Mitchell Expressway without spilling that coffee. Kids, don't, don't try that at home. But <laughs> as long as the car's cruising down, cruising down the highway, no problem. Coffee's just fine in there. When do we run into problems? When you stop. That's right. The moment you touch the brakes, everything changes. All bets are off then, right? Or accelerating out of a stoplight or something changes. Accelerations are what cause me problems with a coffee cup on the dashboard. I saw some people walking in here with notebooks. Anyone taking this, uh, getting credit from their teachers at school? Awesome. OK, if you want to impress them, right? So this is Newton's second law in action here. It basically states the force on an object is proportional to its accelerations. Acceleration basically equals force. These, are, these two things are inseparable. So when we accelerate in the car, slam on the brakes or uh, accelerate out of a stoplight, we are applying a force to this coffee cup. I know, you're wondering where he's going with this. Um, this is really no different. Coffee cup on the dashboard is no different than a building sitting in the middle of town. 
And the car applies forces to the coffee cup, and the earthquake applies forces to the buildings. All we need now is some scale, some way to talk about that. But we understand, all of us have a pretty good intuitive understanding of acceleration. We've talked, long as we were, uh, as long as we've been alive, about g-forces. Ooh, there were a lot of g-forces in that turn. Wikipedia tells me that uh, modern roller coasters, this actually really surprised me, if, if Wiki, the author who edited Wikipedia is to be believed, that uh, a lot of modern roller coasters produce four to six g, that is four to six times the acceleration of gravity. That was way more than I would have estimated. But this is in, that's an up and down acceleration. In the car, it's going to be more side to side. If I come to a stop, if I'm driving down the road and come to a stop reasonably promptly, it's probably about a quarter g. Moose steps out in the road and I stop very, very suddenly, not screeching to a halt, but you know, awkwardly fast, that might be half a g. So we're going to call that, we're going to refer to that as 50% of g, 50% of gravity. So we all know what 50% of g is. That is slamming on the brakes in your car. So we've got a unit for acceleration now. So we're going to go back to our seismograms here. These are actually records of acceleration. The scale is a little bit small. I've got it down here, but that's plus or minus 1% of G. So during this earthquake, the Esther Fire Station, which is where this, uh, this seismic station is located, uh, had experienced about 3% of G, so ex uh, accelerations on that level. That, that's not that impressive. 3% doesn't seem that big. But remember, it's going one direction, then the other direction. So you know, you're kind of flopping your head you know, one side, and then accelerating to the other, back, forth, accelerating. So this would be more like hitting your brakes on and off, on and off, on and off as you're going down the highway. So actually, fairly significant motion. Station up on Sheena Ridge, a little bit less than 1% G. So now we've got numbers <clears throat> that we can use to talk about how that earthquake actually impacted us. My great hope is that someday Will be, people will, uh, will be demanding of what their acceleration is, or we refer to this as peak ground acceleration at times for short, or PGA. My great hope is that we will, you should be careful about this, but my hope is that people will call up after an earthquake, they will hassle us, hound us by email on the phone and say, yeah, yeah, I know what the magnitude is, but I was on second in Cushman, and I want to know what my acceleration was. What was my acceleration? Because that, is a more meaningful, much more meaningful measure. By the way, there are tools. We, we do publish that information for uh, relevant earthquakes for the motivated uh, listener in the audience. So back to my building. Uh, what does that mean then? What can we do with these accelerations? <clears throat> well, from a design perspective, I just happen to be picking on my building, but that's because uh, the GI's got some interesting things going on. It's an older building. Fair amount of concrete. It's been retrofit multiple times for one thing or another. It's got some other buildings hanging on it now. There's this antenna sitting up on top. A lot, a lot of things you might want to think about if you were uh, addressing how will it respond in an earthquake. A moment ago, we talked about how accelerations and forces were inseparable. They were essentially you know, two sides of the same coin. Earthquake or building design, engineering, is all about forces. You're building a taller building, well, what kind of supports do you need to hold that load? What do you need to deal with the snow load? What do you need to deal with the wind load? It's all about forces. So all we need to do, really, is specify an acceptable acceleration. Do we want to build a building that can handle 2% G? building that can handle 8% G, 20% G, 50% G. Once we pick that number, then the engineering takes over. It's going to cost more, of course. Uh, we may not want to do that, but uh, we, can, we can do it once we know. So from a design perspective, accelerations are really, really important. These are the foundations of our building codes. Oh, yes, a schematic of the floor just to motivate the notion that uh, these are structural choices we can make in our buildings. <clears throat> That's all great, 
if we know what kind of acceleration to anticipate. So enter the seismic hazard map. This is a map of seismic hazard. The scale is a little bit hard to see over there. Uh, and it gets a little wonky, but uh, I'll, I'll walk you through it real quickly. This uh, seismic hazard is given as a maximum or as a likely acceleration, this peak ground acceleration we're talking about, in a given amount of time. It's all probabilistic. So we talk about here something that has a 2% chance of happening in 50 years. I'll translate that. For me, that means eh, not probable, but certainly possible. So what is the not probable, but certainly possible acceleration that we might experience? The blues here are in the 2, 4, 8% G range. Okay, these are numbers that we, we've worked with now a few times that starts to make sense to us. The yellows, we're talking 20, 30, 40 percent G. That was slamming on the car brakes really hard, right? And down in the red uh, and the dark oranges, we're up at around 100 percent G. At 100 percent G, if it's vertical at least, uh, that's, that's accelerations at which you can get airborne. So that's pretty strong. But that's how seismic hazard uh, is, is given. And again, this isn't, this isn't some sort of abstract research endeavor. This has real on the ground implications for how we prepare and what we do. So these are, the, this map is actually written into the, the building codes, into the international building codes. It's revised every few years. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather dull read, I would say, but I've leafed through it at least. Many, 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 many pages devoted to uh, earthquake loads, hazards, but it is premised on this very notion. So other groups that care about the potential accelerations in point A or point B, well, the insurance industry. Think about what a business that is to be in. Th think about being in the business of earthquake insurance. You're going to collect policies from thousands and thousands of people. Um, you, better have some, you better have some good economics to back up your business model. I guarantee you that earthquake insurance policies that are being written uh, in Alaska are very, very cognizant if, of this, if not tied exactly to this map here. That I don't know. They may do some custom things. But this is exactly what they're doing to set rates. You know, the rates in the blue and yellow areas are not the same as the rates in the orange and red areas. Just a small aside, earthquake insurance is a pretty complicated uh, endeavor. There's, I, I can't stand here and say, that's an absolute must, or don't touch it. There's a nice brochure out in the entrance if anyone's ever wondered about earthquake insurance. Uh, but again, it's uh, not the most thrilling read. But I brought that, uh, and it does walk through some of the technical uh, aspects for people who are thinking about it. Looks like that. It's out on the table. <clears throat> so, all right. Let's think about what else we can do with this, this, this seismic hazard, this map of where, risk, where our hazards are higher, where they're lower. Uh, here's one example. Uh, we can use it to uh, interact. We can lay over it our developed things, the things that we actually build as a society. Uh, in this case, uh, schools. We care about schools. Everybody cares about schools long ago identified that schools pose particular challenges for earthquake hazards because they're concentrators of people. You get a lot of people in one place. Um, it doesn't help that they're kids and uh, we tend to treat kids well. So we've got uh, schools, we've got places that we care about. Now we can overlay that on the map of the seismic hazard. We got two different pieces in there. We can begin to make educated decisions or guesses or, uh, about, say, where we put priorities or where we put funding or where we don't have to worry about those things. <coughs> so this is a map produced a couple years ago by the Seismic Hazard Safety Commission. The blue dots are schools where it is considered uh, uh, possible or uh, more than a little possible in the course of, 50, of a 50-year period to have shaking of 10 percent G. If you were going to make a decision, you might say, well, you know, let's, let's pay a little closer attention to the blue schools than uh, the ones in black. This is a tool for making uh, educated decisions about where we put resources and where we don't. So the key thing on this map, we got two different kinds of data. One of them is a hazard. One of them is inherent in the Earth itself. 
Those shaded colors. There is nothing we are going to do as humans to change the fact that there's a really high seismic hazard in this area and it doesn't quite seem to be as strong over there. Now, there's all sorts of mistakes in this. There's problems. This is only as good as the knowledge we have. But based on the knowledge we have today, that's something we can't change. The part that we have control over is what's built on top of it. That's where we make decisions day in and day out about uh, our priorities as a society. So we're going to do a little math here. Anybody here had uh, class in partial differential equations? What about pre-calc? Right, who's, who's had multiplication? <laughs> Sweet. I, come on, Carl. You can raise your hand, too. <laughs> Every, okay, we're all on the same page then. We're going to do a little multiplication. Um, I joke, and this is a really simple thing to write down, but actually there's a lot of weight to it. This is actually a very meaningful uh, expression here. When we take hazard, that is the term that describes the part of this system that is beyond our control, the part that is the Earth itself. The vulnerability, that's the built stuff, that's the choices we've made. It, this is the classic uh, three little pigs. Did you build your house out of, uh, what was it, sticks? Uh, straw, straw, sticks, and brick, was that right? Yeah. Neither really great, none of them great for earthquakes, by the way. A wood-framed house would have been better, but that's okay. Uh, that's the vulnerability part. <clears throat> and what we're all, what we actually care about most of the time is this risk. It's kind of, it, in, in many, formulations, it really is the multiplication of these two things. But philosophically, it's kind of important for us to keep things in these two different bins, the hazard stuff and the vulnerability stuff, recognizing that it's actually kind of the combination of the two uh, that we care about. I always think about the, uh, that old saying, if a tree falls in the forest, and how's that go? A tree falls in the forest and nobody's there, does it make a noise? And that's way too deep for me to figure out. But what I do know is that if a tree falls in the woods and there's nobody there, then nobody's going to get hurt. And if a tree falls in a forest really crowded with people, someone's likely to get hurt. So that's kind of the same, uh, there's the tree and there's the presence or absence of people in the forest. So let's walk through just a couple of examples, a couple of recent uh, global earthquakes uh, and take a look through this lens of sort of hazard and vulnerability. This is a picture from Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, what, four year, just shy of four years ago now. <laughs> Magnitude 6.3 earthquake that was uh, uh, just devastating and came as a considerable uh, surprise. There's a cautionary note in here in that magnitude 6.3 earthquakes are not uncommon at all around us. Heck, that's what the Squentna earthquake was this year. Um, didn't do nearly this damage for lots of, uh, lots of reasons, but we, we uh, should take it in Alaska as a cautionary note not to undervalue that magnitude scale. Six is a big, big earthquake. Anyway, not that common, not a common event in Christchurch uh, at all. Many, many, uh, they had not seen an earthquake like this in recorded uh, times. They had had some, di they certainly have distant earthquakes in New Zealand, but not here. And so the vulnerability in Christchurch was actually pretty high for a first world country. The hazard turned out to be much stronger than they anticipated, and as a result, 158, give or take, uh, people lost their lives. And really, part of what was so devastating about this is it kind of came out of the blue. It was a surprise uh, earthquake. Just for perspective, um, the ground, the peak ground accelerations, this idea of acceleration we've been talking about, 200% g measured in Christchurch. So twice the acceleration of gravity, magnitude 6.3. Keep that in the back of your head. There was the earthquake in Japan, of course, the, by far the, the biggest singular event. I still get a lump in my throat when I look at this figure, or look at this uh, picture. It's just a haunting moment in time. And one of, the, one of the many, many tragedies in this earthquake is that Japan did their homework. Japan has invested more energy 
more resources into earthquake understanding and preparedness than anywhere else in the world. They are and long have been the role model. So there's something grossly unfair, not that this earthquake would ever be fair, but there's something notably unfair in this uh, particular case. So their vulnerability, they're, they're vulnerable because it's a dense uh, urban uh, society with a lot of people and uh, a lot of development, but they had done everything they could to bring down the vulnerability side of that equation. What caught them is that this earthquake was not expected. This was an earthquake that wasn't really thought to be uh, a possibility. And so that hazard side was so big that it just overwhelmed the, the uh, preparations that they had done and the things they did have in place. Uh, I, I've heard many times now that, well, the tsunami breached the tsunami uh, barricade. There's actually underneath this wall of water here is the berms built in place specifically to hold back uh, tsunamis. Well, the, the berms weren't high enough. I'm hard pressed to think of other places in the world where they've even built such a thing. So again, there's something notably scientifically unjust uh, about this earthquake. But it's, we can take it all back to that hazards, vulnerability, risk uh, equation. I think the take home point of this, what I'm trying to get at, and I guess what's really at the root of what we do in, the, uh, uh, in earthquake uh, monitoring and preparedness as a state is, forgive the, the cheesy clip art, but this is a good comparison. Whether we think about earthquakes as random acts of God, that is, I don't know what it is, I know it could hit someday, going to come out of left field, see what, see what happens. Or more in the category of rare, but there are things we can do to influence our odds. There are things we can do to understand the probabilities of certain things. I know if I'm rolling dice, two dice, I got a far better chance of rolling a seven than a two. Think about that, Ezra, you figured out. Same thing with earthquakes. There are certain scenarios that are far more likely, certain places where maybe we should be putting time, attention, resources, and other things that frankly maybe we don't need to worry about or in certain times uh, and places. So that's kind of a, a, a through going theme uh, here. And that's where, just to hit on it once again, we get back to this, this notion of uh, making hard decisions and figuring out where we put resources, where not, it's not an easy time uh, nationally, state-wise. It's not like there's all the money in the world. It's easy to say, well, let's just build everything to unbelievably high standards. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. We, we have to make real choices. And a big part of this, a big part of, of why we try to understand risk is to figure out what we can do that's cost effective to lower vulnerabilities and really to think about what we don't have to worry about. That's actually a money uh, saver. So I'll get off that topic. Uh, but this is a, this is was sort of the, the the theme that ran through those slides. All right, I want to hit on just a couple of examples, a couple of little hazards, and a couple more vulnerability examples, uh, and then I'll get toward uh, wrapping up. But here's a map, a couple of random. They come from different uh, areas. This sort of broaden our thinking on this. This is a map of Anchorage. This is a map of soil susceptibilities. <coughs> Basically, green areas are, have uh, grounds, have soils that are considered very stable uh, in earthquakes. Light green, yellow, not so much, and reds and oranges, all bets are off uh, when shaking uh, begins. And this isn't perfect. You can go down and you can squabble with little pieces uh, here and there. However, this gives us some foundation for better understanding the hazard side of this equation in, uh, in an area like Anchorage. Uh, most of Alaska hasn't had this type of investigation, uh, but Anchorage has been very proactive with, with 1964 uh, in their history. Uh, Anchorage has actually been, uh, for many years, were, were considered leaders uh, in the area of building codes and, uh, and good development. So this is a kind of tool that, uh, uh, that, yeah, that bolsters our understanding of the hazards part of that equation. Think back for just a moment 
to the slide. I'm not going to show it, but the slide with Fairbanks and the different levels of shaking during the Minto earthquake. I, I still think about that one. Gina Ridge, Esther, not far apart. There's a big difference between the two. Gina Ridge is up on a, up on a bedrock hill, and Esther, at least the fire station, uh, is not. And surely we are seeing these kinds of differences uh, between those two areas. But that's where this kind of information becomes uh, significant, becomes useful. I'm going to show another piece. This is uh, out of just a, a little snippet of text that I cut out of a forthcoming report uh, that the uh, Matsu uh, Burrow undertook on their school. So this is an engineering analysis of different school facilities and looking at uh, the, the, well, basically their earthquake susceptibility. So now we're, on, now we're on the vulnerability side. This is the built infrastructure. Since it's draft, I replace school names with school A, B, C, and D. They're kind of irrelevant to the discussion. But the important points here is you can go through, take a, a look at the way they're built, quick look at engineering plans, uh, and do some things and come up with, you know, rough estimates. These are, these are not perfect, but ideas about, well, just how earthquake robust is this structure or not. And the key thing is using standard FEMA guidelines. These come through. This one, School A, has a collapse risk of 3%. 1.3%, 3%. Here's one, 50%. A particular structure was identified that for various historic reasons is not considered uh, nearly as uh, strong as the others. Well, you got a little bit of funding. Where do you put it? You know, this is, this is the kind of information that helps make those uh, decisions. So this is a good example of what we can do at sort of the vulnerability uh, side. Yeah, I singled that out. Precast and masonry construction, those are always uh, uh, things that cause concerns uh, for us. So this is great. This, uh, this is one way of looking at individual structures and buildings. And to be fair, the construction community, the building community has long been dealing with these things, perhaps not perfectly, but has been pretty proactive. Uh, if not proactive, at least legally required and bound uh, to address uh, some of these things, at least in public buildings. One of the areas that I think we can grow is looking at this on a community-wide level. We do not do many things, at least in this state, where we consider the impacts of an earthquake from a community perspective. We think about, oh, the shelves on my Shells in the, uh, you know, in the bedroom, make sure those don't fall over. OK, just, just put some bolts in, fine. Uh, we think about the health of a particular building. But we don't think, we do a very few exercises dealing with the larger response uh, as a community. One of the, I'll just point out, there is a forthcoming, or a guide that just came out this fall. Uh, specific to Alaska on how to perform such community level uh, kinds of exercises. And it's a long-winded thing. A lot of, we put a lot of text in it with a lot of different steps and guidelines. But it can really be boiled down to exactly what we've been talking about all along. Identify your hazards. If you don't know your vulnerabilities, go out and actually catalog them. And calculate your risk. Then you know what to do, and you can figure out I, either how to mitigate them or at least how to deal with them when you're done. Uh, an example, I'll give a local example. In that opening slide, the title slide had that fracture on the Richardson Highway uh, in 1937. This is what we think, very roughly, the shaking from that earthquake uh, was. So red areas and orange are uh, very strong shaking, and then as you get out into the yellow areas, uh, shaking was uh, lesser. And we think this is very uh, approximately where the fault uh, was in 1937. From a Fairbanks perspective, the important thing is that this is east of town. Okay, we, got, we got two main supply, ra supply roads uh, in and out of town, right? We've got, we got the road to the east, Richardson, we got the road to the west, the parks. These are our two, uh, our two arteries. Uh, also our, our telecommunications arteries, that's where our fibers run. Uh, it's also, uh, we've got the railroad on the western side. This is the east side of town scenario, if you will. 
If you're planning as Fairbanks, if you're thinking about this earthquake, well, things to keep in mind, let's see, Eielson likely to be hit, probably not a place, probably not looking to Eielson for assistance during that earthquake. Possible disruptions of anything that's uh, you know, headed out in this direction, but probably pretty fine on the west side of town. Probably unlikely to mess with the railroad. Okay, the same earthquake is also considered to be, uh, is actually the, uh, fairly likely in the Minto uh, region, or is a possibility. Magnitude 7 to 7.5 is considered a reasonable possibility in the Minto region someday. That'll be the same earthquake, but on the other side of town. In that scenario, mm, I'm going to watch out for the railroad. I'm not sure I want to be relying on that, but the Richardson Highway is probably open. So two different scenarios that get uh, kind of highlight uh, the way we plan ar around specific kinds of events. One last example here, I'll pull from Valdez. This is a new study, uh, just came out uh, recently, looking at the tsunami, the actual tsunami, uh, likely tsunami impacts in uh, Valdez. And again, the, the scale is small, but to translate, the, the yellows are uh, tsunami or water depths of on the order of 15 feet or so, tapering off to maybe three to five feet in the blue areas. This is kind of a, a worst case, if you will, a maximum uh, likelihood uh, or a maximum uh, inundation scenario uh, for tsunamis in Valdez. And this is great, you can use this, you can begin to plan, you can make some decisions about what's smart to do here versus what's smart to do uh, in other places. <clears throat> this is the hazard side. We haven't taken people into account too much. But what we could do is say, well, how much time does it take to, to evacuate out of different areas on here? <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is a figure of evacuation time. The blues mean eh, 10 to 20 minutes maybe, and the yellows and oranges are saying half an hour or more for a person on foot to uh, walk out of those areas. That would be great if it was all a giant parking lot, but you can't just walk from point A to point B. We walk on roads. So you can go another layer, add in the, add in the road system, and you can calculate, you can begin to estimate the evacuation times from particular places in and around town. If your tsunami scenario allows 10 minutes, you can figure out safe zones and unsafe zones. There's another slide that I'm not going to put up, but you could take this one step further and overlay where population is on a work day or on a weekend or in the summer and on the winter, and this gets kind of controversial, but you can start to put estimated deaths on this figure, and, uh, and that's uncomfortable, and there's a lot of things that are complicated about that. But that's where this begins to take on meaning, and that's exactly the exercise uh, that, that should be done. So <clears throat> I guess I did have one final, final uh, example. This is actually Kodiak. Kodiak has been very, uh, very forward thinking about their earthquake preparations in recent years, and this is a, a study conducted with FEMA where a particular earthquake scenario uh, was assembled, one of the likely earthquakes or one of the anticipated earthquakes in the Kodiak area, and then going through and doing that building by building analysis and quickly uh, get some sense for the types of construction. And what you're looking at here for that particular earthquake is estimated losses. Orange circles are a million dollars or more to that particular structure. Uh, and you, as a community, you begin to get a sense for what state are we in following an earthquake? Where are our issues? Where are our, our assets at that time? And likewise, there is a comparable estimated population loss figure for this too uh, that I haven't put up. So these are great examples, I think, of where we can go beyond this kind of random act of God way of thinking about earthquakes and begin to do things that change the probabilities or at a bare minimum understand the probabilities and allow us to make good decisions. So where do we stand as a state? Last slide. Um, I think we're doing an okay job on the hazards, the broad brush hazards side. 
the kinds of information that give us sort of a sweeping view, comparisons of this area of the state or that area of the state. Yeah, there's always work to be done, many improvements, and I can point out shortcomings, but we're not too bad about this. Where I think we get a little bit weaker is in actually connecting this to communities, making this relevant at the scale of individual uh, uh, villages, even down to the, the building and neighborhood level. On the vulnerability side, well, there's the personal side. There's, there will always be the, uh, the individual and their house level. That's, uh, that's, for, that's just an ongoing education and outreach uh, exercise, I suppose. At the building level, you know, the engineering and uh, construction communities, while not perfect, uh, where building codes are enforced in this state, I think we're in decent, uh, we're in okay shape. Um, the one I'm uh, probably the most concerned about is the large-scale infrastructure. We have so many things in 2015 that, that connect us, so many big things, be they pipelines, uh, mines, telecommunications, transportation, so many systems that keep all the parts of what we do functioning and connected. We don't put much energy, we don't put enough, in my opinion, energy into assessing the earthquake uh, robustness and the earthquake risks and the vulnerabilities associated with those things. We have done some things that are good examples of what's possible, but these are really the kinds of studies that I think uh, we are well poised to be doing more of, and I would encourage all communities in the state to think increasingly about it from this perspective. So, I've talked plenty. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and happy to take questions. <laughs>